Hello, my name is Elder Price, and I would like to share with you the most amazing book. Hello, my name is Elder Grant. It's a book about America a long, long time ago. It has so many awesome parts. You simply won't believe how much this book can change your life. Hello, my name is Elder Green. I would like to share with you this book of Jesus Christ. Hello, my name is Elder Young. Hello, did you know that Jesus lived here in the USA? You can read all about it now. Hello, my name is Doug Bundy and uh, formerly known as Elder Bundy when I too was a missionary, but here I am today as your host for Voices from the Dust TV, Monday, the 19th day of May, 2014. We welcome you to our show where we share the reason for the hope within us, the reason why the Latter-day Saints are Christians, and of course the reason why you should be too. Our message not only means what uh, distinguishes LDS Christian doctrine from non-LDS Christian doctrine, but it also explains why we've declared since uh, 1845 that the only salvation remaining for the Gentiles was for them to uh, be baptized, to repent and be baptized and thus be identified in the same covenant and to worship at the same altar as Israel. Uh, we've discussed this in total. Uh, we continue to today, but you can access the voices from the dust uh, radio TV past episode.org. You just go there, click on the menu item TV. You can watch the program there, or you can click on one of the links provided for our YouTube channel. Uh, our Google Plus page or our Facebook page, which are all entitled Voices from the Desk. Uh, we want to, to uh, uh, explain all. However, on our Facebook page, there's a tab you, in addition that you have to click. There's one for the uh, live show, and then there's one for the archives in the upper right-hand corner of the page, KVFDD. KVFD TV Live and KVFD TV Archive. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we're uh, hope everybody had a good weekend and uh, we welcome you to the show today. Uh, looks like we have Sam, uh, the missionary, Sam, uh, Elder Samuel, and his wife for missionaries, and uh, we have him here at this uh, most days on. Our show, we want to welcome him and and uh, and have him say hi. Can you say uh, hello there, Sam? Uh, hi, Doug. Uh, glad to be here, but I can only be a few minutes, and then I got to take off. Oh, okay. Well, grateful to have you here. He saved me this morning by finally getting through to me that I hadn't started the broadcast, actually. So grateful for him whenever he can be here he keeps me out of trouble so anyway uh, today's whisper out of the ground is taken from chapter 16 of 2nd Nephi the voices from the dust uh, for those of you that may not know is uh, uh, the fulfillment of the chapter 29 of Isaiah the book that was sealed that the Lord delivered to the unlearned uh, in the beginning of his great and marvelous work. And uh, so we're going to, we play that, we call him Whisper Out of the Ground, because he said their voices would whisper out of the ground. And uh, this is uh, chapter 16 of Second Nephi uh, that we're going to play here now. Uh, if I can... I really need my glasses. <laughs> Hello. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, 
each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is unto me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but they understood not, and see ye indeed, but they perceived not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he said, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, for there shall be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet there shall be a tenth, and they shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Okay, well, uh, we see here that the this is someday I I picture this as being studied by people after the millennium, and in the schools when the children are being taught, the probably the main uh, course of study will be these uh, passages of Isaiah and the things that he said, and then it will be very clear looking in retrospect how great these words were. And in this case, we see uh, Isaiah getting his commission from the Lord in heaven, and, uh, and, and then we get the characterization of the work that he is to do, being sent here to explain to the people the great and marvelous work and wonder of the Lord, that he works here when men had denied him and did not know him, but he was going to show them that uh, uh, the scope and the greatness of his work. So anyway, we have uh, uh, these words now, and uh, we saw that before this, uh, Nephi outlined the work, and but now we see how Isaiah is called to uh, uh, this great uh, charge and given this great charge. So anyway, uh, we uh, hope to uh, uh, understand it better as we go along. Now, Whispers Out of the Ground is followed by our situation update. And uh, there are several things going on. But Friday night on the Hagman and Hagman report, uh, Greg Morse, a guy named Greg Morse, outlined probably what is the greatest threat to the Gentiles of America that has been identified to date. Americans have been robbed of their homes, properties, and shelters while they slept. And we'll see Isaiah talking about this in chapter 10. And it won't just be Americans, it'll be the whole world. Because uh, at least their intent right now, and st it starts in America, but it goes out to the whole world from here. But uh, it turns out that they have... Uh, uh, done uh, underhanded, criminally uh, defrauded the American people, uh, and they're going to rob them of their homes and their property. I have a, a clip here, but I didn't get it finished, so let me just play part of it so that you we can see uh, what it is that uh, uh, they're uh, at least what Hagman says. In the at the beginning of his show, 
here regarding this thing. So, is well, it's very simple. The American dream, of course, of home ownership, of having your own what, having your own house, uh, uh, owning your own home, being being, uh, of course, having the, the the nuclear family with the dog and the children and the white picket fence and the yard and. Of course, it's being sold. Their dream has been sold to us forever. Something, folks, something happened. Something happened. And uh, that American dream became the American nightmare. And uh, um, things are happening, have happened, and will continue to happen behind the scenes. Mr. Morse is on with us to tell you. Okay, well, uh, that's all. That's as far as I got. It's a, th a three-hour program, and uh, for the, uh, of course, for our show, it'd be impossible to, to uh, sh show the whole thing. So I've I've uh, cut off that at the beginning to kind of characterize what it go what it is, and he goes in the detail. I guess he's going to be on each Friday night for the foreseeable future to try to answer questions and explain what this is all about. But it's very alarming. Um, what I'm going to try to do is uh, switch to... Uh, this computer is running slow for some reason. But I'm going to try to uh, uh, play this clip and uh, while I do uh, I have to, I, it's a three, so I won't be able to, to play the whole thing. And play, so I'm going to go to the end where uh, Doug has to what has been said by Greg Morse, what, have been, what has been revealed by Greg Morse uh, during the three-hour program, and I think it's a very good uh, summation. So... Uh, Bear with me while I try to find that in the in the uh, clip. We have a fantastic guest for tonight, and for those of you who might have missed earlier this week, as always on Tuesday we had Stan Dale in the second hour. Who behind the scenes they've got him by the throat and the short hairs. Uh. Please, your, your prayers are, are much needed for Mr. Morse. And Mr. Morse, you'll be back again next week, uh, uh, Friday, to give us an update continuation. Uh. And or fraud that exists in my mortgage. 900. Now, let's just assume, clear and directly, who have a lot of ideas that we cannot deflect. If I'm not correct here. Uh, the plundering, the taking of our hard-earned property, physical property, homes, shelters, away from us by fraud, uh, and, and giving it into the hands of government and foreign interests. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. All right. Okay, that was most of it there, so I apologize for trying to search and hunt to get it, but uh, uh, that's essentially what it is. What he says there is that it, they're, they're, they're robbing us. Now, if we read in Isaiah chapter 10, we see that that's exactly what uh, the Lord said that they would do. So uh, I encourage you to go to the... Uh, Hagman and Hagman report, and uh, it's also on our situation update. So just go to our situation update page uh, there on our website, and uh, you can see that video clip as part of the current events uh, set of videos there and watch it. I mean, it's not nothing to watch because it's a, a radio program, but but it's in a video format there with it, so that it could be on our, our uh, uh, video, set of YouTube videos that it, we call the uh, current events. So at any rate, uh, we, uh, 
we'll talk more about that as, as we go on. Looks like we've been joined by Roy. Uh, good morning, Roy. Good morning. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Sam was here for a little bit at the beginning. We had a little rough start. We I started the program without clicking the green button again. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was talking to myself, but then uh, Sam reminded me, so we started a little late. But we played uh, our features, and we're about ready to start our discussion. So how are you doing this morning? Okay. I took a sleeping pill, and I'm kind of still out of it. So, oh, but All right. Well, we're going to be playing some things like we, like we did uh, last Friday uh, that have to do with uh, this Dominion theology and this being slain in the spirit and and the whole thing that's going on there, it's uh, pretty frightening, uh, but uh, it's a, a very important to understand, and uh, especially since uh, the Mormons are being dragged into it in a very deceitful way. Like Brandon House, we're going to see today, uh, where he, uh, because of Glenn Beck, identified the Mormons with these people, you know, which are really the harlot church that, uh, in fact, he's writing a book called The Harlot Church, but he's making the Mormons a very prominent part of the harlot church. <laughs> it's just uh, a little crazy. So we kind of have to take it upon ourselves here to uh, clarify in the public mind what is actually happening. Now, last week, you recall, we began to look at the last best hope of America, according to the words of Joel C. Rosenberg, who wrote that book, Implosion. And uh, he says that hope, that last best hope, is actually the so-called church, uh, the, otherwise known as the body of Christ. Uh, and, but uh, we saw that the implosion of America is going unnoticed by the preachers of America. Remember, we played uh, Joe Hagman's uh, tape, which we or uh, video clip, which we have audio clip, which we have done several times, which show that uh, his uh, opinion was is that if we couldn't find a church that was going to teach the gospel, which was becoming increasingly difficult then uh, they needed to make one that would. And, of course, that's, uh, that's not uh, going to happen. However, uh, the uh, part of the awful situation of the Gentiles, to which most uh, are blind and indifferent, is this uh, formation of the great harlot church, which the Book of Mormon talked about, of course, we read, how that uh, the whore of all the earth would gather together multitudes upon the face of the earth in order to fight against the Lamb of God. We've seen that in First and Second Nephi, where the angel was explaining it, and now here Brandon House has identified it, but <laughs> and he's uh, 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 titled it correctly, but but what he's done is. Uh, in, uh, falsely included the Mormons with that because of Glenn Beck. It's unreal. Uh, but we, nevertheless, uh, we see that uh, uh, here the Gentile uh, religious movement is described in the Book of Mormon uh, as a uh, warning, you know. I mean, they, the religious hypocrisy of our day is laid out there, and then the the uh, prophet warns the people against that, but nevertheless, we see it happening right before our eyes, and there's little that we could do about it, I think, to turn things around. But as I said, what has been particularly unexpected is that Glenn Beck has been thrust, well, he has been thrust, and then, and then he has thrust the Mormon church in the middle of it. But he hasn't done it right. He hasn't really correctly represented the Latter-day Saint doctrine so that uh, the theology could be distinguished between what they believe and what the church uh, uh, doctrine is. Uh, yet uh, he's uh, been cast as part of this by Brandon House, 
uh, as the representative of the LDS Church, you know, he, he always called he was, the label he has is New Age Mormon Glenn Beck. By, by extension, they throw in uh, the Mormon Church and as if it were the Mormon Church being part of this. Uh, they falsely portray in general uh, that the church falls under this dominion theology of the Gentiles, which is a theology that in reality is completely at odd with the doctrine of the Latter-day Saints. Now, I have some clips to start with, and we can talk about them here uh, in a minute, but um, let me uh, find them on this slow-moving machine that suddenly got the case of Carola, uh, molasses here. All right, so let's try this one. If you agree with our strong stand for biblical truth, we invite you to partner with us through the Worldview Weekend Foundation. Thank you for considering making a tax-deductible contribution today or becoming a regular monthly contributor at WorldviewWeekendFoundation.com. That's WorldviewWeekendFoundation.com. Thank you. Faith, spiritual values, moral issues, government, economy, education, work, responsibility. What we think about these depends on our worldview. Now, BCY America presents Worldview Weekend Radio with Brandon House. Welcome. Glad you're with us. I I'm going to do a program today that I think is going to be very informative for you. Not that hopefully all, hopefully all of the programs we do for you are informative. But I think you're going to learn a lot of history today, as I've learned a lot of history in the last couple of days over the weekend, re researching uh, Jerry Falwell's connection to uh, Reverend Sung Young Moon, who many of you know at one time owned the Washington Times. And, I, I, you know, what kind of led me to all this was trying to get a handle and an understanding on what is going on with the new religious right. Is this pragmatism? Yes. Is it ecumenicalism? In some ways, yes. Uh, is it follow the money? In many ways, yes. Uh, but I believe that we look at this generation oftentimes and we think, well, they've gotten off base. They've gotten off track. Uh, this is not what their fathers would have been in favor of. I don't know if we fully understand some of the things that were going on with the religious right in the 70s and 80s that maybe indeed did indeed lay the foundation for what the new religious right is doing today. And so I started thinking, you know, what causes a, a man like Jerry Falwell Jr. to have Glenn Beck at a commencement address declaring, I am that I am. It's a title for God. Never use it in vain. Use it to create what you want to become. I am blank. Which is nothing more, I believe, than the law of attraction. Name and claim it. Positive confession. Doesn't make Glenn Beck, the New Age Mormon, a whole lot different than Word of Faith Benny Hinn. Which is why all these false religions will be able to merge, quite frankly, Revelation 17. But then Jerry Falwell Jr. turned around and had Glenn Beck back. And we've played some of those audio clips for you. I'll make play one or two more for you today. Again, this is page. So I began to do some research. Now, I knew Jerry Falwell. I was on Jerry Falwell's television program, flew off to Liberty and was on his television program, wrote some articles for his newspaper. Uh, they bought up quantities of my book, Cradle to College, spoke for the convocation service out there for the high school or for the college kids years and years ago. But uh, and I'd been with Jerry Falwell on many occasions uh, and in his office there at Liberty and and uh, was moving in the liberal circles, as many of you know. And then several years ago now, it's getting on to be a few years now, I turned against these ideas and what these folks were doing because I came to realize this moralizing that they're doing, much of the ecumenicalism they're involved in in order to somehow build alliances to take back the culture. We're really watering down the gospel, compromising the gospel, raising the flag over the cross. And I began to wonder, well, maybe Jerry Falwell was involved in more things than I knew about personally. Maybe some of you knew about these things. Um, but some of you are older than I am. I'm 45. And so some of you are older, and maybe you were reading about these things in the papers at the time when they were going on. I remember them when I was, you know, either in high school or 
or newly married and wasn't even paying attention to these kind of things. But I, I, I was not aware of some of the things I'm going to share with you today. But the Internet uh, makes these things available. And I'm going to quote to you from the L.A. Times, the Washington Post. And I basically think that what we're laying out here is, is that the, the beat goes on. The story is the same. That what one generation allows, the next allows in excess. What one generation allows, the next allows in excess. And I don't think that Jerry Falwell Jr. is really doing much differently than what his father did. That's the opinion I'm coming to. I go back to what I wrote in Religious Trojan Horse, page 17, where Jerry Falwell Jr., Jerry Falwell Sr.'s son, Jerry Falwell Jr., who now runs Liberty University, was on the Glenn Beck radio program, and this was in 2010, right before Glenn Beck had his big ecumenical event on the lawn there of the Lincoln Memorial, a spiritual event, as Glenn Beck called it, to look to one God. And here was Jerry Falwell Jr., as reported from Glenn Beck's own website, on his radio program in 2010, and Jerry Falwell Jr. is quoted as having said, quote, if we don't hang together, we'll hang separately. I mean, that's what my father believed when he formed Moral Majority, an organization of Mormons, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, people of no faith. And there are bigger issues now. We can argue about theology later after we save the country, end quote. And I've told you that's really odd, because he says we can argue about theology later after we save the country, yet I believe this statement reveals a great deal about the theology of Jerry Falwell Jr., because not only will God not bless such compromise, but I think it will bring his judgment, as I've described Second Corinthians six fourteen through 17. But how can you say we're so, we, we can argue about theology later when Glenn Beck is doing nothing but pushing theology? That's what Glenn Beck is pushing, is theology. I mean, his whole event was looking to one God, right? Uniting and looking to one God, and you had Richard Land there, and you had John Hagee there, according to press reports and pictures I have, and you had e uh, Muslim imams there, according to Glenn Beck's own words we have on video, and they were all locking arms, uh, something that's completely unbiblical. And yet theology is all through what Glenn Beck is doing. Now, I went into a little more research for my book, Religious Trojan Horse, to see when did some of this begin as far as the religious right working with folks that they maybe didn't agree with theologically. But they okay, so what, uh, what he does is uh, ties this. He, he finds out that... Uh, Jerry Falwell, actually way back there, got in trouble financially and ended up going to uh, the head of the Unification Church, seeing uh, whatever his name was, Moon, Reverend Moon. And uh, they nobody knows to this day where the money came from that this guy had, but he had a lot of money. And it uh, turns out... Uh, a house here has uncovered, you know, millions of dollars that it went to uh, to from Moon uh, to uh, Jerry Falwell's uh, Liberty University, and uh, that was really astonishing to him because they know how he had to cover it up. If he hadn't covered it up, people knew, you know, how crazy off the wall Moon was. And uh, if there had been a, a connection there, he would have lost the, all that conservative support that he had. But in the meantime, uh, he has this money, and uh, so then it begins. See, you have to understand, Jerry Falwell was a Baptist, right? And... Uh, so it was supposed to represent the conservative view of uh, the Bible and theology and so on. But we see how it is morphed, and we can't play all in this uh, uh, clip here, but he explains how uh, all that uh, became involved with the Reconstructionist uh, uh, movement. And uh, eventually, the new apostolic reformation, uh, NAR, and uh, the uh, uh, 
there's another one that's uh, associated with the International House of Prayer, IHOP, and uh, and so on. And the latter rain movement, and he gets into the really really uh, big detail of it. But the, as you can see, the main thrust here, the the driver went back. And how strange is that? Now I'm going to play uh, the a uh, last part of this first clip a little bit here. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, that was the other one. I'm going to play the, the first part of the next clip, all right? Because what he had was a show that went on for Friday. So I'm going to play a little bit of the next one. Now you have to... to uh, uh, bear with me because I hadn't had a chance to, to clean these up, so it's got uh, some of the introductory music and, and comments and stuff for a few seconds at the beginning. I'll try to maybe skip past that, but uh, we'll see what happens here. Okay. If you agree with our strong stand for biblical truth, we invite you to financial angel Moon, who is, object who, who is objectionable, to many fundamentalist Christians because of his unusual biblical interpretations and his recruitment of young people away from their families. The person writing this for the LA Times, Robert Perry in 97, said, I've discovered the $3.5 million contribution while examining the Internal Revenue Service records of Moon connected organizations. On the 1995 tax report for the Women's Federation, there was a line item listing $3.5 million going to Christian Heritage Foundation. Susan Furfman, the Federation's vice president, admitted the money was targeted for Falwell's Liberty University. And then I read to you from an article in Forbes, Forbes.com, an article, Righteous Brothers, and it talked about uh, <clears throat> one of the three guiding forces behind Jerry Falwell in his final decade was Ronald S. Godwin, and he went on to openly tell Forbes.com about his leaving to work for Falwell as a close associate and then going on to, uh, and it helped him run the moral majority. He had first been executive vice president of the moral majority. And then he went on to work for 12 years, according to the article, <clears throat> for Reverend Sun Young Moon in his organization. And he turned to Liberty University. And uh, yet the man is still there today. He's the one we saw recently on with Benny Hinn. And I'm making the case uh, that really <clears throat> pragmatism, pride, profits, politics, and false prophets, the first prophet being P-R-O-F-I-T, the last one being false prophets. Now, this is really the story of pragmatism, politics, pride, profit, and false prophets. Whether it's Sung Young Moon, whether it's Mormons, whether it's uh, uh, the false prophets of the Church of Rome, of the Mormon LDS Church, it, there's this um, ecumenicalism is going on, and it can all be tied back to pragmatism, tied back to politics. They're dem no, let me pause it here. Notice how he keeps tying the Mormons in. Imagine the Mormons being part of the ecumenicism. It's not. It's to This is totally wrong and false. And he not only emphasizes it and throws it in there often, but in this case he threw it in twice. As if once was not enough and you didn't get the point. Mormonism as part of an ecumenical movement with the Catholic Church. Can you imagine? It's, this is mind-boggling. Uh, excuse me for the interruption, but I just couldn't help it. Dominionism, their reconstructionism, their culture war, their pride, their need for money. And many of these false world religions have used evangelicals as their, may I dare say, the historical term, useful idiots. Please understand, I'm not calling anyone a name. That is an, his, that is an historical term. When communists would co-opt uh, educators, professors, the intellectuals, and they would co-op businessmen and others, and they would tell them that they will be part of the inner circle and they will have some of the spoils, and they were referred to many years ago at the height of communism as useful idiots, and many to Day within evangelicalism are simpletons, biblically speaking, that have become the useful idiots of people wanting to harvest their credibility. 
and that is very clear from my research on Sung Young Moon. He was quick to want to get himself in pictures with well-known evangelicals and then make sure those were put into his publications to make sure people knew that he was very mainstream, and yet he was leading a cult. I'm going to play for you just a little bit something I found this morning, and that is a, a real treasure, in my opinion, from my mentor and friend, the late Dr. Ron Carlson, speaking in 1978 on the cult of the Moonies, the cult of Reverend Moon. I found it this morning, and I want to play some of it for you today. But before we do, I want to return to a speech that I started out with yesterday, here, all new material now, part two, in this series, Pragmatism, Politics, Pride, Prophet, and False Prophets. This is a speech by Reverend Sung Young Moon, according to the unification.org website. That would be his website. He's now deceased. But uh, Reverend Sung Young Moon reportedly gave a speech in January, January 2nd, to be specific, 1992, in New York. And I want to read to you some paragraphs. I gave you this yesterday, started out with this yesterday, and I want to continue now. He's talking about uh, Ron Godwin, who's now Senior Vice President, I believe that's his title, Provost at Liberty, back there again after having worked for Godwin, according to Forbes.com interview. But he, Moon, continues to refer to himself as Father. Father sees the presence of Dr. Ron Godwin, Dr. Bob Grant, Dr. Siles uh, as very precious. Father looks for these precious three collaborators, supporters, and members of this great movement, almost like Jesus' three disciples. The three of them are really accomplished giants in our world. By uniting with Reverend Moon's, and he would talk about himself in the third person like that, by uniting with Reverend Moon's ide ideology, they will become even greater. Each of the three has very special characteristics. They are very different characteristics, as much as Jesus' three major disciples were different from each other. Moon goes on to talk about Jerry Falwell. He says that those three champions, and he's got to be referring back to Godwin, Grant, and Siles, those three champions just bring them at work, just bring them and work them day and night. If they can't keep up with the schedule and they run away, that is all right. I will bring somebody else. But I think these three strong men won't run away. Father, again, remember now, Moon refers to himself as Father. Father invited Ron Godwin to join in this great crusade, not because he's just a great businessman. He is, but importantly, Father is concerned about Jerry Falwell, who represents the great Southern Baptist Christian community. He's not fulfilling his responsibility, so Father would like to see if Ron Godwin can fulfill it. Unless he knows me now, Jerry Falwell is in the position of a foreign person. Jerry Falwell cannot become president himself. He should come together with Father and make the spiritual and moral foundation for a God-chosen man to be president of the United States. We have to have a righteous, God-centered president in this country, not just anybody. He goes on to say the Washington Times, remember Moon owned the Washington Times, is set as, as a side activity. The prominent mission is a spiritual mission. That is basically what Father is saying. This is very important. The Washington Times is secondary as as far as Father is concerned, your primary mission is a spiritual mission, and the revival of Christianity is crucial. Now listen, folks. This is new. I did not get to share this yesterday. Listen, pay attention to what Moon's goal was, and ask yourself, why are self-professing Christians leaving Liberty University, the moral majority at the time, and all those groups there on that campus and in that area of the country, Lynchburg, and running to work with Moon, according to Forbes.com, and then running back to Liberty? Why would anyone accept them back? Why would anyone want to go work for a man like Moon and his business organizations when he's making it very clear even the Washington Times is really about a spiritual mission? This speech in which Moon gave, again, back in the early 90s, 92, January 2nd, 92, he says, the AFC alone cannot save the country. Christianity must be rejuvenated. All Christian ministers must be re-educated. Are you listening, my friends? Reverend Moon is saying all Christian ministers must be re-educated. He goes on to say they must become new Christians. Unity with Reverend Moon is of vital importance. Unity with Reverend Moon is of vital importance. With of course, Reverend Moon is now dead, and uh, but things have gone on. So, so this is what we need to understand. I wish we could play the whole thing, but we'll run out of time for sure. 
if we do. Uh, but this tie between Moon and and uh, Southern Baptists, which then morphs, uh, morphs into this uh, union with the Third Great Awakening. You hear Glenn Beck talking about the when he was running his big uh, uh, get-togethers, uh, conferences, or whatever you you want to call them. That uh, he, he talked to, when he was hand in hand with these guys in Washington D.C. It was uh, this great Third Awakening. See, and I kept wondering, well, what are you talking about a Third Great Awakening? You need to be talking if you're Mormon. You're not going to be talking about that because that's <laughs> That's the gathering together of the harlot, right? I mean, uh, you, they're there to fight against the saints. The saints aren't part of that. Uh, they're there to fight against the Lamb of God and the, and the uh, saints that belong to the Church of the Lamb. Doesn't Glenn Beck understand that? And uh, yet, of course, uh, that was back in when? 2000, uh, uh, 2008 and, uh, or 2010. I can't remember now. It's uh, getting all kind of merged in my mind. But I think it was 2010 when he gathered everybody on the mall in Washington, D.C. And now we have this uh, bunch that are uh, part of what uh, Brandon House is calling the Harlot Church, uh, now talking about this huge meeting that they're going to have in Washington, D.C. on uh, the Washington, on the mall. Uh, this July, this coming July, and they're going to have a series of 14 mega meetings, they call them, or mega conferences where they're getting people together and they're going out into the streets. And I think we've played that. I, I might even have a, a clip of that uh, somewhere. I'm not sure that I got it ready for today. But, uh, but this is really important to understand. This huge movement has... Uh, come from the money of Reverend Moon and nobody knows where his money came from. So, hey, uh, Doug? anyway, what I'm going to do now is, uh, did you have something you wanted to add to Al at this point? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, <laughs> where does this guy, if he does all this research, how does he put uh, Glenn Beck with the Mormons? You know, he talks about all this research. Yeah, well, he talks about the research, and then and and uh, and then he starts putting the Mormons with everything else, and it just doesn't make sense. How oh, I know. His research for Mormons comes from Ed Decker, who's an apostate Mormon, and, and uh, who uh, really has you know a sinister twist to everything that the Mormons do. But of course, Glenn Beck is self-professed Mormon, uh, but uh, when when he goes and he's invited to these meetings, uh, at, like at the Liberty University, uh, which is just making Brandon House and company livid because they let him get away with that is Glenn Beck get away with state with putting Mormon doctrine into his talks. He's gonna he he's played clips and things uh, about that. We showed last time uh, some of the clips where Glenn Beck is actually. Uh, referring to Joseph Smith as a martyr, oh, that, that makes them mad, see, because they consider him to be a, uh, a, a gunfighter, <laughs> almost, <laughs> and not, anything but a martyr. But uh, then he gets in uh, things like uh, saying that, oh, yeah, we're just another denomination of the Christian community. Well, that is crazy, Brit. Brandon House knows that, and anybody that knows Mormonism knows that, and we know that. But what is Glenn Beck trying to do? It's not like he's, you know, stating that he's a leader of the Mormon Church. He's not, and he's not saying it, you know, he's not telling it like it is. He's telling it like he wants it to be. We are, he very seldom mentions the things that we talk about here, the voices from the dust as being the fulfillment of uh, uh, the great and marvelous work and the gathering of the house of Israel and the fullness of the gospel, all the things that we're talking about, he has a different view. And it's as if this piece, this big main piece of Mormonism is missing. See? But uh, 
they uh, they 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 try to make him into a new age more you know with this crazy Mormon doctrine a new ager with this crazy Mormon doctrine who is part of this ecumenical movement to gather together the Christian uh, harlot church you know and of course there could be nothing further from the truth but let's uh, uh, let's go ahead and and play part of the third clip now again bear with me because it's got this introductory part I was didn't have time to cut out if you agree with our strong stand for biblical truth we invite you to on a odd and in many ways completely unbiblical I mentioned the guy down in Texas the word of faith guy down in Texas Tilton and how Tilton and I was quoting you and you're mentioned in this article a lot uh, quoting you, you from one of your books written in the mid 80s and how Tilton was reading. Okay, now he's got a, a dissenter called uh, Thomas Rice. Dr. Thomas Rice is his guest, who's an expert on all this stuff uh, that has come out of the uh, uh, New Age, and not so much the New Age, but what do you call it, the, the uh, Dominion Theology. Uh, see, and they've been explaining this, and and who our house has, and so now he's brought his guest on to explain what it is from a. Uh, so it's not so much from a point of research, but from a point of a person who who was involved and was in the one of the leaders of it. See, so let's listen a little bit to what he had to say. Some his wife was. This is the Word of Faith preacher down in Texas. Many of them remember him. Uh, his wife was reading Gary Demar. That led to her convincing him to bring in Gary North, and you had these Reconstructionist Presbyterians, fundamentalists working with the Word of Faith, all agreeing that if we don't agree theologically, we can at least agree on the culture war and Reconstructionism. And I quoted you in your book as saying that Gary North said that they had the uh, fundamentalist preachers with their schools, that would be their high schools or elementaries or colleges, they could educate that generation, the fundamentalist preachers. Then you had the Word of Faith folks that had the big television networks, and then you had the Presbyterian educators that were Reformed, uh, Reconstructionists, some of them he was referring to, like himself, Gary North, and then they could produce the virtually what they'd be doing is producing some of the information, and they would all work together for this culture war and for reconstructing the country. And um, that was what I stated. Now, this Reconstructionist group is unhappy because they seem to uh, say that we were not doing our own research, that uh, we were not being uh, accurate in our presentation, you and your book, me and what I presented. Well, that's not true because basically the way I see it, Dr. Ice, is this. Two people, Gary North and um, uh, Dave Hunt, were having an argument, and Dave Hunt and Gary uh, Gary. North are having this argument, and they're both writing about each other, and they were arguing about all kinds of issues. Well, in the process of the argument, this information that we quoted was thrown out about how the Reconstructionist and the Word of Faith and the fundamentalist preachers can all get together and work together. We don't have to go into all the neon, the, the detail, nuance of their argument to understand the facts that were being thrown out that were legitimate facts, and that's what I threw out. Would you agree with that? Well, yes, of course, and that and you quoted from an appendix in our book that House and I did. It came out in 1988, and we worked on it for two and a half years, uh, and called Dominion Theology, Blessing or Curse. And I had been involved in the Reconstruction Movement for almost a decade, and I used to read this stuff feverishly. Um, I was a theonomist. That's an aspect of Reconstructionism that believes that Christian, the church is under Mosaic law, and that the civil magistrate is obligated to implement, they would say biblical law, I would say Mosaic law. And, you know, I moved away from that uh, view eventually, and but because I had invested all those years, 15 years at least, of reading in depth all this material as it came out, uh, you know, I was knowledgeable of this stuff. I don't think we were taking any of this stuff out of context at all. What they disagree with always, uh, for example, I remember uh, when our 460-page book <laughs> came out, you know, they uh, wrote an article, I think Gary North, I don't know, somebody like that, 
uh, about all the factual errors in our book. Well, as far as I remember, we had three factual errors. One was that Gary North had a Ph.D. in economics. He actually had a Ph.D. Well, anyway, he goes on to talk uh, about that accusation of the these Dominion theologists' uh, adherence uh, to their uh, attack, you know, and so they're saying that they, they accuse them of factual errors and they go back and forth. But the, the big thing here to understand that we want to understand, and tomorrow we'll have uh, these specific clips ready uh, for uh, our, uh, uh, so that we can understand what it is that they're saying. But let me briefly try to lay it out on the table, and then we'll hear them say it, and we'll hear them play the Glenn Beck clips and so on. But uh, let me try uh, to do this in uh, the best way I can. Uh, he is uh, uh, really uh, saying that these people expect that, and they interpret the Bible to mean that they have to take uh, dominion of the earth before Christ can return. See? So they have this kingdom, or they establish this kingdom, and the idea is that they have to go forth and convert the world to uh, Christianity until essentially there's no wickedness left. Everybody has been uh, converted and uh, have turned away from evil uh, through the work of the, their king, see, and uh, then Christ can return, and not, he can't return until that is accomplished. Well, that that is a perversion of the doctrine that we've been talking about, where the Lord himself gathers his people, we can see that from the scriptures, and uh, he uh, brings them uh, to the arm of his power, he establishes them in order to sanctify his name, which has been profaned among the Gentile nations. And uh, and he's going to show that, you know, his promises to his people, that he's faithful to keep them and that he will take the cup of suffering from their hands and place it into the hands of their enemies. And he will remember them and be merciful unto them, and restore them to the lands of their inheritances. And uh, there he will build the temple, and they will have the power of God come down among them, and uh, Christ himself will be in their midst. We read that in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible. And it will be a great time of rejoicing while they gird up their loins, preparing themselves for the coming of the Savior, clothed in the brightness of his glory. So you see, there's this, just as Sam said, he said last time, you know, that the Satan always builds up a counterfeit that looks very close to the real thing. Well, this doesn't look all that close to the real thing when you understand it, but it is a counterfeit to convince people of the world that uh, this uh, kingdom, that you know, this devilish uh, thing that uh, that uh, they call the spirit uh, is is taken over big time, and we saw one of the big ones was Kenneth Copeland. And remember, we had uh, a program that featured him and many of his ministers gathered together—not his ministers, but ministers that are part of all of this—gathered in a big meeting that was addressed via video by the Pope and by this Anglican uh, uh, cleric named Anthony, I can't remember, Tony something, but I don't remember his last name, but anyway, he had been working with the with the Pope, and so they were communicating, uh, and they made actually a video raising their hands and so on, so we could see how blatant it is that the Harlot Church is gathering together, and we know the purposes of it. So... Uh, let me play just a little bit more. I'm going to, I'm going to, because uh, he sometimes summarizes what went on in the in the clip or the day before. Because each one of these clips is one of his daily programs. So I'm going to play the next clip, and hopefully he will summarize what he and this Dr. Rice came to. 
and and uh, maybe we could make sense of it here. Uh, bear with me. If you agree with our strong stand for biblical truth in Sun Young Moon, and now today you've got Jerry Falk. I'm going to break that down on the television show. What what does it mean the lust of the flesh? What does it mean the lust of the eyes? What does it mean the and the pride of life? Because those words in the original have great meaning far beyond what they mean in the English text in the English translation. But pride, pragmatism, profit, the three snares that have compromised evangelicalism. And I've kind of been touching on that this week, and I've talked about uh, trying to give a history to where we are, how we got here. We seem to look back on the 1980s with a nostalgia, and I understand that. I graduated from high school in 88, and there was a little nostalgia there. We had more liberty and freedom. There seemed to be a, a definitely a more moral society. Things that were not accepted then are so openly and frequently accepted today. And uh, we look back on the, the 80s, and maybe some of you look back on the, your youth and your childhood of the 50s or the 60s in the same way maybe I would look back onto my younger days, uh, it would think, wow, those were the good old days. A lot of people do that, I think. I think that's common as you grow older. But were they really good old days? Was did, did, Is it like a, an apple that looks pretty and looks um, edible and, and it looks like it has a, a quality to it, but the core is rotten? Was the core of modern-day evangelicalism even beginning to rot in the 1980s? Was the foundation being laid for the rotten core of evangelicalism that we see today. I know we say things are so bad today, and, and look at all the crazy things people are doing, but it, 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 we didn't just wake up in 2001, 2002, 2005, 2010, and it was this way. This was a progression. And I'm finding out more and more that in the 1980s and early 90s and mid-90s, things were progressing with a generation we have given a pass to. Yeah, I've talked a lot about the new religious right, but in the last few weeks I've done more and more research on the religious right itself. And maybe that was when a lot of the rot started. It wasn't uh, outwardly noticeable, but there was an inner rottenness that began even then. I believe that might be the case. And I've been sharing some of that with you today, uh, this week, and we'll do so again today before we go to Jimmy DeYoung a little bit later in the broadcast. But... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. Article on Christianity Today, uh, 1984, De September 7th, 1984. September 7th, 1984. We talk about Glenn Beck today. You know, Liberty University seems to have a history with Reverend Moon. You got the Moonies to the Mormons, from the Moonies to the Mormons, Liberty University. And we talked about the LA Times article and other articles, Forbes magazine, talking about the Liberty University connection to Reverend Sung Young Moon. And now today you've got Jerry Falwell Jr. introducing uh, Glenn Beck at Liberty University and Glenn Beck spouting all kinds of uh, garbage and I, I'm of a different denomination. I'm a different Christian denomination. I'm Mormon talking about uh, our father as though we all worship the same God. We worship the Mormon God who evolved a flesh, from flesh and bone to being the God of a planet near the star of Kalab where he has eternal relations with his goddess wives and sends spirit babies to this earth. Sorry, Glenn, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not my God. But, but we, we asked the question, how did Jerry Falwell Jr. get here? Well, maybe he had the example of his father. Jerry Falwell maybe had his relationship with the Moonies, and Jerry Falwell Jr. maybe has a relationship here with Glenn Beck, the Mormon, from the Moonies to the Mormons. All right. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, there's a lot more to say about it and to see what he's saying, understand what he's saying is important so that we can try to make clear what uh, what we're seeing. So anyway, I hope everybody has a good day. We're out of time. And uh, my prayer as always is that the Lord's choicest blessings will be with us all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>